Welcome to Howard Memorial Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Ben Kane, the pastor here, and I am excited to welcome you to worship this Sunday, our live stream, but also to talk to you a little bit about what's coming up in the life of this church. A week from today on Palm Sunday, we have a major, wonderful service that we want you to be a part of. It is a come as you are. If you want to wear your sweater, if you want to wear your jacket, if you want to wear whatever you want to wear, I want you to come because our children are going to help tell the story of Jesus triumphantly walking into Jerusalem. We're going to have five confirmands who are going to join the church and proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ and the church. And afterwards, we're going to have a reception outside, weather permitting. And so we want you to be here. And if you have young children, we also want you to come to the Easter egg hunt, which is happening on Palm Sunday at 4 p.m. Go to our website, howardmemorial.org, to find out more information about all of these and know that we would love for you to join us on the live stream, but we would also love for you to join us in this amazing sanctuary where we glorify God together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
All right, we're going to go ahead and get started because Bill Good just reminded me that we are actually live right now. So welcome to those who are live streaming with us. Uh, you heard all of our conversations, whether you wanted to or not. Um, okay, so hopefully everybody has a sheet, uh, our, our handout sheet. If you don't, there's more in the back. And those who are online, hopefully you got it emailed uh, and are able to follow along with us tonight. So we're going to finish up Kate Bowler's book tonight. Um, and we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to talk about the question over here, what makes you special, which is a question that Kate brings up in this ninth chapter. We'll talk about that. And then we will spend a little bit of time at the end. A great question was asked, what does this book, what does Kate Bowler's book have to do with Lent? Uh, which I think was asked in a way, uh, also, why did we choose to use this book for Lent? Which is a great question. Um, and I'm not going to answer that yet, but I will answer it, I promise. And I would love to also hear why you all thought we chose this book for, uh, for Lent. And also what it has to do with Lent, um, which is a conversation about what Lent is. But nonetheless, I think as we go through, we'll talk about it, and then we'll actually spend a little time with that. So that's the, the flow of this evening. Um, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for this day that was a gift but not a promise and for your presence in it, for your gift of love and grace and hope and forgiveness, for your constant presence throughout all of it. We are mindful of those places and spaces that need our prayers, especially in Ukraine and other places that are affected by the ravages of war. Uh, we also pray for those that are known to us in the silence of our hearts. We also pray that your spirit might descend upon us, that tonight might be a good conversation about uh, what it means to be human and what it means to be a believer. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, so um, the questions on the board, what makes you special? And this comes from Kate's book, obviously, and, uh, and, and it's a question that she was asking as she is now in chronological um, book-wise, book in the chronological reality, um, she is both on the cusp of finishing her cancer treatments and also becoming cured. Um, and she is talking about that space of, I'm a cancer patient, and then she's going to shift into, I'm not a cancer patient anymore. What does that mean? So she's asking this question that I want us to, to think about, and that is, what makes us special? What makes you special? Right? Maybe just if you want to answer in the ways that your mom thought you were special, right? <laughs> or in the ways that you think you're special, right? It's okay to be a little egotistical with this one, right? We can, I think we can handle it. Okay. That does make you special. Well, that's not the question. The question is, what does it make you special? Okay? So Jesus loves me. What else? Okay. I have God living in me. Yes. Okay. What else? I'm just going to shorten that and say, made in the image of God. Okay? Y'all are doing like the really great theological answers, and these are wonderful, but you can be a little bit more egotistical. <laughs> Curly hair. Yep. Okay, thank you for getting us into the other realm. Yes. Okay, yes. Those that can sing, that makes you special, right? Also makes us special those who cannot sing. Okay, what else though? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
That's true, though. I, so I, I will add to that that I am special because I was the youngest, right? I, I was the caboose. Yes, I was the youngest of four, right? I, I did nothing wrong. I still have it <laughs> to this day, right? Yes, well, that is also true, right? What makes you special could be that you're the oldest, right? Is anybody a middle child? Because you're not special, sorry. Like, you're the forgotten child. <laughs> right? Yes, my sister, my, oh, my, I, we actually have two middle children, my brother and my sister. And my older, younger sister uh, talks about how uh, no one knows she's, she exists because it was... My oldest sister's picture as a baby, my brother's picture, and then mine. And my parents were too poor when she was born to afford pictures. So she's like, I don't even exist, <laughs> right? Okay. And the reason we, br we bring up this question is what makes you special? Kate is asking that question because right now what makes her, uh, not right now, but in her life what made her special was that she was the stage four cancer patient. And she was surviving the stage four cancer patient's reality. She got into this super duper special, it sounds like it's incredibly difficult to get into clinical trial. That made her special, right? And now as she's coming out of that, um, and, and Catherine did a wonderful job of talking about this last week, coming out of that, that which made her special doesn't make her special anymore, right? No, nobody really cares about if you need to go see another, I mean, people care but not in the same way when you go for your follow-up scans. As opposed to the first time that she had major surgery, everybody stopped what they were doing, right? Um, and so she's dealing with this question, which, which I think is a very human question, right? What makes you special, right? Why is today special? It's not my birthday. Uh, it's not a feast day kind of in the, in the, in the church world, right? And, and no, I'm not going to dive into this too deep, but m what makes you special, right? This is a really human question. And the reality of, of Lent is coming to terms with our humanness, right? What does it mean to be a human? It means that sometimes we have really bad days because we didn't feel special, right? But what could have made her special was the fact that she was going to try to do everything that she needed to do over 50 years in <laughs> four months, right? She has boundless energy. As you saw, with, if you were here with last week or watching online with Catherine, if you thought Catherine has energy, Kate has even more, right? Which is just incredible and probably incredibly exhausting for her husband, um, but in a good way. So, and so she brings this up. This is how the, the, the ninth chapter starts. Um, and she says to her mom, right, maybe I should run or maybe I should train for a race, right? Um, we're always looking for something that will give us the energy to get up in the morning or to commit to something, right? How many of us get a new, like, planner at the beginning of the year and think, like, this is my year? And then, or, I, I mean, gym memberships skyrocket at the end of December in the beginning of January. And then that's why they do a full year, right, because nobody goes in February, <laughs> right, but you're going to be special right there, and her mother, I, I wish her mother would write a book, to be perfectly honest with you, because uh, her mother, you know, talks about, oh, that's really nice, like, you're really sweet, um, and has this uh, at the top of page 164, right, uh, the parental response of indifference, right, it's sort of like, oh, that's really sweet and nice, like, you're probably not going to do that, um, but I'm going to support you, right? And then she talks about um, what it's like to be, apparently what it was like to be around Kate when she was a, um, a teenager, right? What are you doing today, her mother asks. Well, I'd like to say prostitution, but kids call it sex works nowadays. Okay, bye. Um, I would yell slamming the door behind me, right? <laughs> um, but, but this is the piece that I, thought I found fascinating is the last part of that second, uh, it's actually the third paragraph, maybe fourth. Uh, depending on how you count, and it's on page 164, and it says, apparently adolescence is the process of believing that you belong not to someone, but to everyone, right? So what makes you special? This is a question we ask from the minute we're born, whether we know it or not, to the minute we die, right? What makes us special as an infant is that you 
hopefully two humans, love us deeply and want to care for us, right? That makes us special. We're also unbelievably adorable, okay? Or else people would just be like, yeah, that's cute, but let's move on, okay? Uh, What makes you special is you get older, as you start to learn how to walk, you learn how to use your fingers and all of this kind of stuff. And then as an adolescent, what makes you special is, and you know this as parents, but you also know this as people uh, who went through this, is, is your ability to separate yourself from your family, to create some type of identity, okay? Um, and that's what adolescence, in my opinion, is, is you're attempting to figure out who you are. The challenge is, I don't know that you ever do figure out who you are sometimes, right? Uh, and that's okay. I think that's not a bad thing at all. And so she's, she's remarking about that because I think she still senses some of her own adolescence in the idea of maybe I'll train for a race because if I train for a race, that will make me special or it will help me identify who I am. How many of y'all have thought like if I just do this, this will explain or help me understand who I am, right? Did y'all take classes in college or graduate school or even in high school and be like, oh, that'll tell me whether or not I'm going to be this or this, right? One class is going to do that. But then there's those people who do, right? Somebody took biology and now they're in neuroscience and you're like, wow, that did not work out for me. <laughs> right. Or on the flip side, right? I always heard this like if you were going to go into medicine or whatnot, take organic chemistry and you'll know whether you're going to be in the medical field or not. <laughs> right? If you could pass it, not like it, if you could just pass it, you could do it. Okay? Um, and, and she talks too, and this is where she gets into Kathy bringing this point back up is from her standpoint, what makes the, this is going back to this, what makes you special? Parents at some point, as the kids are figuring out who they are, Parents have to stake, you know, take the opposite step away and let them become who they are. And that means letting go, okay? And her mom is trying, Kate's mom is trying to let go. But also what Kate is talking about is Kate is trying to learn how to let go of her son in case she dies, right? I mean, she makes these kind of these jokes about Tobin, her husband's new wife, and how they never forget, or they have always forgotten about Kate and all this kind of stuff, which is just her, I think, being dramatic. But who hasn't thought about that, right? As you step away from something, uh, then, then you wonder, are they going to remember you, right? And she talks about this at the top of 165, right? This is the burden, I would say, of a mother's and or a father's love is how it must hover without landing, Right? You have to let your kids become whom God has called them to be, right? That's another thing that makes you special. It's not that only that Jesus loves you, but that Jesus has called you to be somebody, okay? But we have to take that step back and allow our kids to be that, which is incredibly difficult, right? You've heard of helicopter parenting, <laughs> right? Now they call it Blackhawk helicopters because it's like even like more on top of it, Okay. Um, and, th- and that's, the, that's the challenge. And she is doing this in some respects with her own son as she wonders whether or not she's going to be around. Okay? Um, and then there's another piece, too, as she thinks about this, is she is thinking about her own body as she thinks of the, the, the very Christian, very Judeo-Christian understanding, flesh of my flesh. Like, she comes from somewhere, I think, as she's also trying to ground herself. Um, and this is one, page 165, and this is the, the fourth quote I want to read out. Um, and she says, I should be feeling better these days, but in th- there is an intense nothingness that I experience when I see myself in the mirror. She's not self-loathing, not frustration, but simply nothing at all. Right? She doesn't see anything. It may have started, she says, when it, in the early days of my treatment, the physician's assistant casually told me that the sooner I got used to the idea of dying, the better. But I certainly understood it shortly after that when I had a dental appointment for a routine checkup. My dentist was young and pretty and fresh out of dental school. And when she reviewed my new medical history on her clipboard, she paused, she took off her mask and said, I don't understand, why are you even here? Right? And I thought I was something, but I might be nothing at all. And this is where she gets her quote, I am not special. I stammer as I try to explain to my friends. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm special to the people who love me, thank you but I just don't believe I'm terribly valuable. Does that make sense? I make people feel uncomfortable by saying this, so I stop, right? And then she keeps going, and this is the the quote on 166. I have walked this hard thought to the end of the line. I am probably replaceable. When I needed to make plans for the world without me, my new son's new mother, my husband's less difficult wife, it became easier and easier to imagine, 
Okay. So she's also trying to talk herself into, and I think we do this too, into the fact that we aren't special, which means that the world might be okay if we weren't, uh, as we are not around, right? Which is a dark thought to have, but I think she's in a dark place in the sense that she has this hovering cancer diagnosis literally following her around as if it's a black cloud. And so she does wonder, am I something? Um, And by something, she thought she was a body who would live to some healthy lifetime. And suddenly that's being taken away. And there's reminders of it, right? I mean, as you think about this, I don't know. I've never been through stage four cancer, but I don't know that I would go to the dentist. But she does. And that's why that dentist is like, why are you here? Like, you should be at a doctor's office. You know, not that I'm not a doctor, but (laughs) I don't know that you need to worry about your teeth right now. And I I think there's a level, too, and this, this gets to what makes you special, but also the Lent piece. What Kate tries to do again and again and again, and I think she does a good job, and then she fails, and then she does a good job, is she points out that sometimes the, the hardest part about being a human is just being human. Going to the dentist, waking up in the morning, uh, praying, going to church, going, uh, you know, making sure your kids get off to school if you have kids, right? Loving your family. Those are incredibly difficult things. But we all want to do these great feats, like go see Troy like her father, um, go, you know, buy, I forget what she buys, a Winnebago kind of thing and drive across the country. Like, we want all these big stuff, but maybe it's just the little things, okay? Um, so that's, that's one, one, uh, one piece as I keep, I think I'm just going to keep answering your question, Barb, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, let's keep going, 166 and 167, and she, this is her um, coming to terms with the fact that her body has failed her and, and is failing her, but she's going to keep um, coming back to it. And she talks about, you know, I've, she's tried different forms of meditation, breathing exercises, routines, affirmations, nothing. I lose weight, I gain weight, nothing. I hire a body image specialist and fill out workbooks about healthy eating, confidence, and loving myself. But somewhere between the hospital and my Instagram feed, a feeling slipped away. This body is my home. No matter how hard I try, that's gone, right? So she's trying to find a home space, right? We as Christians, this is it really, really important for us, is that we are, because we're made in the image of God, right, and because we have a particular DNA that involves sometimes curly hair, okay, um, it means our bodies matter, right? And that's a really, really, really important, and it's often overlooked as a Christian theological statement, is that these bodies matter, okay? Uh, the body is a temple, is part of it. But there was an old Gnostic tradition that said your body doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about it. Your body is that actually that takes you from God. It takes you away from God. Uh, It's just this sinful thing. But what the Christian and Christ proclaims is that the body is a way in which we proclaim our love of God or how God made us. And we're to love our bodies. However, they're broken, right? They're not perfect. We all look in the mirror like she does. And hopefully we all, at worst, we just see nothing at all as opposed to what would we change, right? I don't like this. Everybody has that piece of your body where you say, I just don't like it, right? If I just looked like Jerome Creech, I'd be happier, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, but we all have that, and she is trying to point that out, and this is where she gets into uh, page 167, talking with her friend Chelsea. I think I'm losing my luster, right? You have plenty of luster, Chelsea <laughs> reassures me, her eyes wide shut. Excuse me, her eyes wide like she's entering a hostage negotiation, right? It's a horrible phrase we've coined to describe the consequence, consequences of aging, neglect, and something more. We have noticed that sometimes people can simply fade. For reasons that seem mysterious, some people no longer sparkle. And looking at them now, I wonder if that person is me. The polish of youth has been wearing off, and I'm confused about whether to hide the evidence. A whole new wave of advertising has been reserved for me, the newly christened middle-aged woman, to explain what I should be worried about. Crinkles around the eyes and softness around the belly have been relabeled as crow's feet and muffin tops. Those thin white lines, what remains of a successful C-section and a baby's triumphal triumphal entry, will require a tummy tuck and a six-week recovery, but the bat wings on my arms can be fixed with a studio membership. Where other anxious novices will take up the stationary bicycle or a spot in the bar, we are learning our box tie numbers systems to eliminate stubborn grades. (laughs) 
Oh, uh, but truly nothing seems as harrowing as the hair surgeries for men with dreams of middle management. And she asked this great question that's on the middle of your page. Should we hate the evidence that we have survived? Okay. And that's a question that I just, I literally just let, let hang. Should we hate the evidence that we have survived? For her, she had, um, I don't know exactly, but I know by her description, she had massive surgeries, and so there were definitely scars on her belly, okay? Um, the females who have had a C-section, right, there's a scar to prove, to show, right? If any of us have had surgeries, right, there, there is some, and it depends, right? It depends on if it's a facial scar, right, evidence, versus something you can hide with clothing, this is the challenge, I know she doesn't talk a lot about that, this is the challenge of mental health and mental illness, right? Because it, their scars are inside you, but nobody sees them, right? You don't see that your brain doesn't fire on all cylinders, so to speak, okay? You look perfectly fine usually on the outside. So do we hate the evidence that we have survived? That's a question I just kind of ask you all. Did that strike you as much as it struck me? It should be a badge of honor. It's a conversation starter. Right? Yeah, Tammy Faye. Yes. I mean, there, are, there is the, the beauty of the body aging. But then there's also, we can fix that. And it's alluring, she'll talk about that, right? Her conversation with Derek, the plastic surgeon, who sounds fantastic, right? That, that conversation is hilarious. Um, yeah, so the, uh, earlier this week I had um, a text conversation with three other pastors, all male. And um, it, one of them was saying they were doing some videos pre-pandemic, three years ago. And somebody asked about them and so he sent them to the people at the church. And he said, I, I rewatched them, and he's like, I looked so young, I looked so energetic, and, and he said it was only three years ago, and then he, he said at that moment, I understand why celebrities get plastic surgery, because if, if that's your, like, selling card, you got to keep it going, right? So then we asked him if he was going to get plastic surgery. <laughs> he never answered us, um, but yeah, that, that happens, right? So in some ways, how many, I mean, we've all had this conversation, do you let the gray go because it makes you look distinguished? Or do you get rid of the gray? I don't know. It's a, it's a personal question, but uh, it's a question that we, um, we, we think about, okay? Um, and there are, if you don't, for men, right? Just for men, I think has its own, own aisle at Walgreens. <laughs> every hair color. <laughs> they can match the, every hair color, right? They even have it for beards now, I think. Like, it's fascinating. But those are things to think about. And so what she does, and we'll keep moving. This is page 169, right? It's th the top. There's a vast wing of the wellness industry whose purpose is to stop time. The suburbs are a wash. I would take that out. I think everything is a wash. It's not just the suburbs. Everything is a wash with Botox parties, CrossFit memberships, anti-aging drug stream, drugstore creams, rumors about Karen's facelift. The upper class have their spa cultures, recreational plastic surgeries, wintering, summering, and rec recent uh, acquaintanceships with a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur hoping for a future reanimation through cryogenic freezing, which is actually true. Uh, there are proven principles to decelerate cellular aging. Erase those years in only 30 minutes a day. Turn on the television today or tonight and see celebrities give expert breakthrough advice about the fast fat blasting exercises revolutionary routines and shocking results. There's no aspect of mortality from infertility to cancer to death itself left untouched by the tireless merchants of limitless health. But as much as I roll my eyes at the outrageous promises, I miss the possibilities of being decorative. Right? How many of us feel prettier, happier, cuter, whatever language we want to use when we come out after getting a really good haircut? I have, right? Or you get like a new piece of clothing and you're like, that is the piece of clothing, right? There are some clothes that, that, that help. 
Uh, shoes, right? I'm a shoe, shoe fanatic. You get a right, nice pair of shoes. You feel comfortable. I think, you know, and so she, I, what I love about this is this is the gift of lamentation, right? You, you lament that there's something that's going to make you better, and you lament that because you think, oh, they're doing terrible things to bring you there. But at the same token, you see that there's kind of a good side to it as well, right? Everything, we talked about this in the Bible study this morning, everything is both, can be both good and bad. There's no such thing as pure good and pure bad. There's pure good known as the triune God, but there's no such thing as human tainted stuff has always got a touch of bad or a touch of good on the reverse side, right? And that's just the reality of life. Because we make choices, and this is where she's going to get into this choice with Derek, the plastic surgeon. And one of the points I was making this morning is every choice we make means we didn't choose something else. And that may not be bad, but it may mean that we didn't do certain things and we didn't cultivate certain relationships with friends or family or churches and whatnot. So we just have to think about that, which is the challenge of being human, right? As her book title says, there's no cure for being human. You can't create some type of system whereby you make every decision and it's perfect. At least I haven't found it. If you have, you can market it and make millions of dollars. Okay? So let's look at Derek. This is Derek the plastic surgeon. Um, Also, I I have absolutely no idea how she has time for her family with all of the doctor's appointments she goes to. It's incredible. (laughs) Um, And I guarantee you she writes emails and letters to each of these doctors like she just seems like that type of person she keeps up with them somehow okay so she's talking to Derek the plastic surgeon um, because she obviously has had massive surgeries for the cancer um, and you know is wondering whether or not uh, uh, what she can do about it right how much pain are you in this is uh, page 170 getting into 171 right ask me to remember all the surgeries I've had in order but I lose track because I'm standing almost naked in an open gown and suffering from an incurable case of Canadian small talk What made him choose plastic surgery? Did he see last night's episode of The Bachelor? His mom must be so proud. He crouches down in front of me, making an inventory of every one of my surgeries from a clipboard and pausing to match each one with the scars he can see several inches from his eyeballs. Is there a reason I have to be almost naked here? I am a human display case. Finally, he stands up. I would think that someone with your history would be grateful that it's not much worse. That, you were talking earlier about her previous book. That's something you shouldn't say to women. Right? I would be grateful that someone with your history would be grateful that it's not much worse. So she asks him, when you look at my body, do you think, hey, this could be worse? I paraphrase, she says. Given the number of surgeries, though, Derek says, you have to consider what a fortunate position you're in. Okay? So this is where she gets into when we think what makes other people special. Right? Kate should actually have it much worse. She shouldn't be as happy, but she is. If I went through that, I wouldn't be as happy, and that's what Derek is in some ways, um, asking, Uh, which is not necessarily wrong. It's just maybe not the best way to say this, okay? Um, So he's going through. They have a long conversation. Apparently, he brings in some other friends, or not other, um, not friends, other um, plastic surgeons to see what this is going on. Um, And she's uh, asking whether or not I should get some of these surgeries, and this is the top of page 173. I'm not asking for everything or nothing, right? Like, get all of these surgeries and make my body look like new versus doing nothing. I glance over at Derek. I'm just trying to figure out if I would feel more at home in my body if I didn't have quite so much evidence that it almost tried to kill me, okay? And this is the challenge when I went, going back to the nothing is purely good and purely evil. Our bodies, our DNA is that which is beautiful and wonderful, but it also is that which could kill us, right? There might be something in your DNA that means one day you're going to get some type of disease, okay? Um, There there might be, you know, you, uh, we all talk about this where uh, we have family history of fill in the blank, right? And we all have family histories and there's often cancers, um, Alzheimer's, you know, whatever we want to say, the list goes on and on. <clears throat> so that's which be- that which is beautiful, right? That which is made in the image of God is also that what is going to, uh, ultimately, even, even if we live to 180 years old, which I don't know if, if that's possible uh, or if we would want to, at that some point, your body's going to fail you. It just can't go on living, which is a reality of life. 
Um, which is a reality of what it means to be a human, right? There's no cure for being a human. Um, is, uh, is something to bring up to you, okay? So she's, she is asking this question that I think one of the things that makes her books so special is she, in my opinion, she asks questions and she talks about topics that you may one day go through. And you might not be going through this right now. Hopefully nobody's going through stage four cancer. That's just scary. But she gives you these little nuggets that you can carry with you when you do go through something similar or you're with someone similar, okay? Uh, that's what I think makes her book really, uh, really wonderful. So I want to uh, keep going down page 173 and make a little plug um, for, uh, for Sarah Bessie, right? Suddenly I remember two things. This is right after she's talking to Derek. Suddenly I remember two things, that there's a waiting room full of women looking for breast augmentation consult consultations and that I'm lecturing plastic surgeons on the importance of appearance. I tell this to Sarah Bessie, whom I call on the way out of the clinic because a nice car, since a car accident left her in chronic pain, Sarah has been the kind of friend who understands the cost of a body that tries and fails and still has to make dinner. I want to say that I'm happy for a body that works, I say to her, embarrassed, and I'm happy. I'm also deeply grateful, but I'm trying to figure out how to feel more like sunshine again and less like a well-functioning sewer system. Right, the body is not a meat sack. It's memory and orgasms and snuggles and swimming in the summer, she says, pausing. It's weird that working so hard to stay alive makes you feel less human. So the plug that I want to make is Sarah Bessie, whom she mentions in this book, is um, going to be at Montreat this, Montreat this summer for the women's conference that we're sending a group of women from Howard Memorial to be. Okay, she's the keynote speaker, so she's going to share her story, and she's written a book or two. Um, in similar vein to, uh, to Kate's book, I've actually not read them, but I've heard her speak. She's a wonderful speaker. And she does tell her story about being in a, in a car accident that changed her life. Um, but she talks about it in a way that's not, uh, in, a, in a very Kate Bowler way, okay? That doesn't make you feel bad as you read her story, but also doesn't say like, oh, this is the best thing that ever happened to me, right? Everybody should be in a car accident, you know? Uh, you can get kind of that, that side of this. She talks about it in a very human way, that last quote being one of the best things. It's so weird that working so hard to stay alive makes you feel less human, <laughs> right? What it, what it is like to think about trying to get back to uh, that weight that we had or, or that, um, that status that we had can sometimes be that which makes you feel less and less human. Because you're, you're so focused, I think what she's saying is you're so focused on something that it takes you almost out of your body as opposed to getting in touch with the body that God gave you. So that's, the, that's a plug to see. I, I think, Sarah, it would be a wonderful, if you're interested in that, there's information in the, um, in the main office. So she keeps going, 174. This is where we get the Gnosticism. We complete, uh, contemplate that for a moment. There are many religious traditions that argue that the spirit ought to triumph over the body in many ways. In Christianity, we reject this as heresy called Gnosticism in the 4th century. But wouldn't it be nice? You know, Sarah, dying is a great time to want to be all spirit and no flesh. Sometimes the body is a weight pulling you all the way down. And it's so hard to love the stone that drowns you. Whew. That's hard, right? But it's true, okay? And this is the challenge of Christianity, right? Because Gnosticism was, it, it was amazing. Uh, Augustine was a Gnostic for a long time. Not a long time, for a couple of years. Um, and it's, it's very, if you've ever read it, um, Plato or some of the, the great philosophers, the separation of the body and the, and the soul, right? The soul is that which goes on, but the body is just sort of something you use. By Christ coming and, and becoming flesh and feeling the flesh and being hungry, being thirsty, being tired, um, and then ultimately being beaten and dying on a cross, but then coming back, and what does he do with Thomas? Right? He says, Let, touch me. Like, I brought my body back because your bodies matter, right? That's a very, that, that, that is a, a big deal in Christianity, okay? Our bodies matter. That's why we're called to not only take care of them, but we're also called to recognize that they're going to fail us, okay? I don't know why I feel bad today. Oh, well, probably your body <laughs> not working. It's okay to feel bad, right? Um, and, to, and she's bringing that up. The Gnosticism is, is this, it's a, it's an, um, I took a whole class on it. It's amazing and crazy and also really compelling, but then ultimately um, they kicked them all out of the church. Um, 
in a very bad way. They burned them, um, which is not the way we should get rid of people. <laughs> uh, we're going to keep going, talking about when, the, when was the last time that I felt whole. This is, excuse me, page 174. The last time I felt whole didn't make any sense. Surgeons were harvesting cancer from my useless organs, cutting tissue into ribbons, and paperwork had been drawn up for me to sign. So yes, I knew the odds. Each day was a terrible, winning, terrible winnowing, separating wheat from chaff, but I was a surreal com completeness. I remember clearly in the hospital how I felt this strange closeness with God, how I did not feel like dry grass. I was becoming less and less, but I was not reduced to nothingness. God's love was everywhere, sticking to everything. Love was in my f husband's hand on my back, steadying me, a lightness under my feet, and all over her son Zach's velvety ears. I flushed with embarrassment when I described this feeling to my friends, stumbling as I tried to explain its sudden appearance. Wasn't it there before? That love itself was suddenly more real to me than my own thoughts. Despair was never far away, but somehow the seams of the universe had come undone and all the splendid ragged edges were showing, right? How many of y'all have been through an intense experience, right? Maybe it's cancer in, in your life or a family member's or a friend's life or uh, some intense experience of, Planning a wedding, planning a funeral, planning a vacation, right? It gets you all jazzed up and you want that. But the truth of the matter is that's not life. Number one, your body can't handle always being on a high. At least mine can't. Maybe yours can. But we all want that. And even though she was in the worst state her body has ever been, in the sense that her body was trying to kill her or kill itself, she felt most alive and most whole. And it's partly because people were caring for her. There was a tenderness to that care. Um, she felt really special, right? She was the center of attention. Don't we all want to be the center of attention, right? It's real easy for us youngest to be the center of attention, right? Uh, oldest, you don't really want the center of attention because it's always negative, <laughs> right? But nonetheless, she had that. And, and at a moment when you would think that she would feel furthest away from God was a moment when she actually felt closest, Okay, it almost makes you think of Christ on the cross probably felt this intense closeness to God until the end when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? But nonetheless, uh, she, she feels this incredible specialness and she now that she doesn't have that anymore, right? She's been cured of cancer or at least is on the way to being cured. She wonders, and this is on page 175, I, how am I coming undone, but I'm not unmade? Okay, so she's trying to figure out, okay, I used to be Kate the academic who had a husband and a beautiful son, and I was at Duke Divinity School, and I had this life, and then I was Kate the, the professor who had stage four cancer who also had a son and a husband, and this is my life, and now she has this, I'm Kate the professor with a son and a husband and a post-cancer patient. I don't know if that's the correct terminology, but we'll go with it. And she's trying to figure out who she is now. And I would say each of us go through this too, right? We were, if we were single, and then we started to date and got married, and then we had kids, and then the kids go off. Who am I now that my kids don't live at home? Or if I'm a grandparent, right? Or if you've lost a spouse, right? Who am I now? I think we're constantly asking this question, who am I now, right? And she says how, uh, you know, this is middle of page 175, how I was coming undone, she tells her best friend, Laura, or her good friend, Laura, how I'm coming undone, but I'm not unmade. Like, I still have something that connects me to other people. I just don't know what that means. And I won't read the next quote because I don't want to be quoted online um, saying a, 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 a bad word in church. Um, but she says, don't, don't give this up. Don't run away from the fact that you're coming undone, but you don't feel like you're being unmade. Right? I have to imagine Abraham and Sarah, when they said yes to God and they started walking away, felt like their lives were coming undone, but they felt like they were not being unmade because they were. And it's a powerful part of being a Christian, a pe person of faith, but I think most especially being a Christian. I mean, I don't know that they, they had the language to say this, but I have to imagine all of the disciples, when Jesus said, follow me, and they said yes, knew that they were coming undone, but that something was not being unmade. They were being made. They just didn't know what they were being made into. Okay. And in some ways, we have to give up, don't, don't give up the memories, but we have to give up these old lives, these seasons, in order to become who God's made us in this season, right? And that's hard. It's really hard. 
Um, but she's going through this, and she starts, um, starts to experience this. And she talks about, this is on the top of page 176, right? I, uh, her friend keeps going, when you started to face your own death, you started to have these experiences, right? Death will do that, right? Um, a deep, intense experience will do that, and whereby you're like, whoa, I've, I've got to change the way I do things, right? Yes, she says, I exclaim, exactly, it felt like I was magic. These moments of transcendence have been scattered everywhere like bread, breadcrumbs. Those experiences of magic, they are the truth of our lives, but we can't get confused. Life can be rich and real, but people will want you to say these moments make your life complete. Does everything feel wrapped up, Kate? Does it feel perfect? No, I say, my mind's spinning. Is it wrong that I want to raise a kid and I want to learn, relearn French and I want to write a children's book and I really, really, really want to go back to Disney World? <laughs> right? I think she thinks that, like we all do, right? I've got to get rid of these old lives in order to become the new person. And the truth is, sometimes you can carry some of these things to the, carry them forward. And then she writes this great, I mean, I can only imagine this is a true story, right? I've wanted to go to Disney World. She goes, and then she writes her parents a bill, sends them a bill with a note that says, there, you took me. It was glorious, <laughs> right? It's absolutely incredible, um, and then this is the middle of page 177, so we can jump into the last chapter. I know the love of a God who is beyond all wanting, but the more I live, the more I want and want and want. And then Laura says, there's no such thing as a finished life, Kate. Eventually we get eternity with God, but in the meantime, there's this crappy regular stuff that, if we're really lucky, might feel like a trip to central Florida. And then she tells that amazing story that I think all of us have probably witnessed in an airport, right? And she's flying, I think she's flying home from Atlanta to Raleigh after one of her cancer treatments. And um, the, uh, the dad is getting really upset with the kids and it's super late and he yells at them, this is a once in a lifetime experience, he shouted, flushed with anger, and we are going to make some family memories. <laughs> Y'all ever had those experiences? No, you're perfect parents, right? I, uh, I still to this day remember a story that um, I watched someone at a theme park. It wasn't Disney World. I think it was a Six Flags. And this family, they were losing it. It was the end of the day, right, where you always lose it. And they had just bought their kids ice cream. And one of the kids, like, dropped the ice cream. It was just about to fall over. And the mom grabbed that ice cream, put it back on there, and said, you're going to eat it. <laughs> I thought, there, that's true. It's very true, right? I bet they still think about that at, or talk about that story at uh, family gatherings. All right, so then let's end with uh, Unfinished Cathedral. This is um, her story of uh, visiting a, a cathedral in Portugal, which actually I think she's probably home by now. Um, if you follow her on social media, she actually just filmed uh, a little clip of being there, and that's where she was right now, or a week ago. And I think Catherine said she was in Portugal. She's actually revisiting this um, cathedral. Okay. Um, when I, funny story, when I first contacted Catherine to see if she would come and, and, and leave last week, she said, um, well, I'm really sorry, Kate's not in, in the country during Lent this year. And I said, well, I thought it would be kind of pretentious to ask if Kate would come. I wanted you. And she was like, why would you want me? Uh, to which I said, because I, I would love to hear what it was like for someone who cares for someone like Kate. And then I was like, I mean, if you could get Kate, that would be amazing. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, that, uh, that's where she's been. And so she, this whole chapter starts with uh, just a, a harsh reality, right? The truth is they're, they're on the page, right? She's a lab rat. Some of us responded to the immunotherapy drug and lived. Many did not respond and died. Others died because they were placed in a control group and denied immunotherapy until their cancer spread out of control. I feel like I'm free falling. Hadn't Dr. Cartwright joked about this? The lab rat. Is that what we are? How many of y'all have had the experience of you're in a very similar uh, weight, weight, age, um, lifestyle, all of those things, and someone who's in the exact same position has a heart attack and dies, or something terrible happens and you think, why them? Or a, a car accident, right? Why did they die and I didn't? Or, uh, um, or the cancer treatments. Why did her body respond to this cancer treatment and those others didn't? And that's, a, that's, that's a, um, uh, survivor's remorse, right? There's actually a term for it. Um, is, uh, so she, she looks at this, and then as she does, right, she dives into research. 
um, and she constantly jumps into what, what happens with clinical trials, right? They make these, uh, hospitals cannot afford many of the partnerships, so they accept these partnerships with multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical corporations, and they call the clinical trial research, and she dives into all of these things, um, and, you know, and, you know, you're supposed to follow the rules, keep their schedule, trust the experts, smile, you're so lucky, uh, and she just, she's starting to struggle with that. And she struggles with that because um, the truth of the matter, and this is page 183, and it's a, it's a great quote. It's hard, though. So often the experiences that define us are the ones we didn't pick. Cancer, betrayal, miscarriage, job loss, mental illness, a novel coronavirus, right? We often think that that which is going to define us is finding the person that we're going to love for the rest of our lives, right? Uh, finding the dream job, dream car, dream whatever, but often what defines us are the things that happen to us that we had absolutely no control over, right? That's hard, you know? And we do think, and this is where she gets to um, a little bit down the page, we'll kind of move forward, right? And it's this quote on page 186, the strange cruelty of suffering in America is his insistence that everything is still possible, right? So some things might experience, some experiences might define you and you didn't pick them, but you can work past them. You cannot make, you can, uh, everything will turn out okay. Uh, that's something we say, don't we? This is a good, I need this, right? I need that uh, uh, to be able to persevere, right? I don't want that. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I just want my life to be easy street, <laughs> right? I don't want to lose. If I'm being honest, right, I, I know like it's going to teach me something, but at the same token, I don't want to be taught something. I just want to keep going because I'm special, <laughs> right? But, we, uh, we, but, but life is going to show you that you're not actually that special, and there's some things that you did not pick that are going to have to end up dis- defining you, okay? And this is the challenge of, of being a human, okay? Uh, and and it, it, on both a superficial level, right, we, we root for teams and sports, and we think that our rooting for them is going to make them amazing. And then it doesn't, and it's like, well, that's their fault, not mine. Right, I cheered them on. I coached them from Tarboro, North Carolina. I don't know why they weren't listening to me, (laughs) right? But then it's on the the deeper, like more meaningful side, not that sports aren't meaningful and all of that stuff is, we we raise children, we raise our lives, we we live our lives, and we think everything we do is going to work out perfectly. And then it doesn't, and it's like, but I did everything right. But somebody ran a stop sign, or your kids didn't quite turn out the way you thought they were, or, or you, you know, all of that stuff, right? Somebody got sick. Kate didn't plan to have cancer, right? She was actually planning to teach that day, and then she had to go get major surgery. Um, so she talks about, you know, the strange cruelty, I think, sometimes in suffering in America is this insistence that everything is still possible, as opposed to accepting, in some respects, that this is just part of being human. This is that wellness industry that she talks about. You can stop time. You can't. You can't. I mean, you can for a minute, right, or two. But the ultimate thing is every vacation you've ever been on ended, right? Except for my marriage. It was wonderful. It's wonderful, right? <laughs> right? They're, they call it a honeymoon period for a reason. There's an ending to it. Oh, I wish we could stay here forever. You can't. Because what happens? You could stay there forever, but then there's going to be a rainstorm and it's not going to be as special. <laughs> right? If we only had these days and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's the, the, the question that she's asking. Uh, or she's not asking these questions. She's pointing out these realities, I should say. Um, and then I, I do, I want to read this, this part where um, she talks about, and this is page 186, where she gets the title of her book is... Uh, a few years ago in between scans, so this is pre-pandemic, they, they make a pilgrimage uh, on Route 66 and they're going by the Grand Canyon and they stop in this little out of the middle of nowhere sanctuary, a, a chapel, right? And it, the floor uh, was a loose gravel and someone had nailed together some benches to face a chunk of stone serving as an altar. But the light of the setting incandescent orange poured through the windows and lit up the walls which were covered with graffiti both fresh and faded. I ran my fingers along the black ink covering the altar and a pen marked gouged the soft wooden walls. Almost every inch of it was covered with words. I miss you every day. Please let my daughter be the way she was before. Did you make it to heaven, my love? 
Helen, I'm weak, but you already knew that. I look up and hundreds of slips of paper were stuffed into the rafters and the seams and the walls and all the people had fallen into the cracks in the universe, undone by the smallest of tragedies. We try to outsmart our limitations and our bad, bad luck, but here we are, shouting the truth into the abyss. There is no cure for being human. Right? This made me think of two things. The first one was camp. You know when you go to camp and the bunk beds are just like littered in a beautiful way with graffiti? Right? Ben stayed here in 1997. Or the, the ones where you, you, know, you thought you were falling in love for the rest of your life and you, you drew the heart with the, you know, BK, LW forever, right? And it didn't last past getting home. <laughs> um, and I, I thought, so I thought about that, but, th- but those are the days, right? You want those experiences. The other thing that I thought about is um, if you ever get the chance, and I hope that you do, to go to Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall, the old western wall of the temple, people take, uh, you write little prayers and you stuff them into the cracks, hoping that God will take them, all right? Um, and and there, there are thousands of them, right? And they've been doing it for years. They, I mean, they literally push them into the cracks, okay? And that's when, if you watch, if you see, if you Google it, right, and you'll see people, they, they put their foreheads on it to touch it and, right, and all of that. Um, but there's no cure for being human, but there is a, there's not necessarily a cure, but there's a reality in what she, she writes here and this whole book is, is a confession of what it does mean to be human. It means to hurt, it means to love, it means to be hurt, and it means to, to give love, to receive it, um, to go back and forth, okay? Um, and she talks about uh, how she wants to make this prayer, and Tobin comes in um, when she's just hanging out by herself in this amazing little cathedral, uh, or I, I would call it a cathedral. It's probably just a really, really small chapel in the middle of nowhere. Um, and she says, you know, uh, this is the middle of page 189, right? I, one of the teachers had too much faith in humanity. Uh, I'm not going to say this correctly because I didn't take Latin, but dum spiro spero, he would say, shaking his head, while I breathe, I hope, right? While I breathe, I hope. So there's this hope that something will come of this. And that hope is always that that which will come of it is outside of us. That's God coming into our lives, right? That's what she's uh, attempting to point out. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But it's only when we express them publicly that we realize we're not alone. You're right. Um, and that's the, that's the joy and the challenge of life is sometimes we do think we're all alone, but then we find out that other people are struggling. Other people's marriages aren't as amazing as you thought they were, and yours might be strong, right? Other people might enjoy doing certain things. You just didn't know that was happening. And that's the reality. And that's not a cure for being a human, but it is a way to be a human, Okay. Um, and then she talks um, about the, her, her dad, and they end up, uh, I want to end here because we're getting close to time, but she goes, she and her father end up going um, to Portugal, and actually her parents go, and then uh, she and Tobin meet them, and they go to Portugal, and there's this beautiful, uh, very gaudy, it sounds like, cathedral, and it's unfinished, <clears throat> and if you get a chance to watch her video that came out today or yesterday, something like that. Um, she walks around it so you get to actually see it. And it's open air, right? So she, you can literally see to the sky, which a cathedral, you're supposed to have a roof, <laughs> right? Or at least in the classical sense of a cathedral, you would have a roof. And there is no roof. And she just thinks, because she and her father are historians, particularly religious hor- historians, they're just sitting here being like, well, this is just terrible, right? Boy, did they really mess this one up, you know? They, they really, they shot for the stars, um, but, but they really, really messed up. Um, and then this guy comes around, right, there, and, and he just gets so excited, and he keeps saying, isn't it wonderful? It's never finished, dear. Isn't that wonderful? And then, you know, she keeps asking him, what do you mean? Like, this is not great. And he says, don't you see it? It's us. I can't imagine a more perfect expression of this life. He beamed at me. I came all this way to see it. We are never done, dear. Even when we're done... We are never done, right? What a, um, I mean, 
what an amazing way to think about life, right? That's certainly your optimistic way of, of thinking about life. But, it, but it, you, I have to imagine, I don't know, I wasn't there, obviously, none of us were except for her. But I have to imagine that that, that man had that sort of excitement about life that makes you excited. It's contagious, okay? And she asked this question a little bit earlier. It's at the bottom of your page on the back side of chapter 10, right? How do we live now is the question that, that she's asking. So, and I want to use that as a, a segue to... Um, to, to this question, why, why have this book, um, what does this book have to do with Lent? Um, first of all, I mean, just in a, in a really uh, easy way to answer this question, why did we choose this book? One was because I knew it was going to be incredibly well written, it was going to be incredibly accessible, and she was going to say things about her own life that were going to touch the really tender and beautiful parts of our own lives. Okay, she might be the only person that we know in this room or that's watching online or is, is, is a part of us that has gone through stage four colon cancer. But yet, everything that she, not everything, but a lot of the things that she experienced, I felt, and I hope you did too, that she was speaking to a part of my life. What it is like to be a patient. Um, what it is like to deal with a body that doesn't work the way you always want it to work. Uh, what happens with relationships? What happens when, I mean, for example, for this uh, tonight, what happens when you feel special and then what happens when that specialness, you don't feel as special, okay? Um, there are those seasons in our lives when we feel pretty amazing and everything's going really well and then it goes away and we start to think, well, what happened? You know, what happened? I think about that with, with, with adolescents, go back to her point of adolescence, with kids, you know, the, 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 there were those kids who, who grew up really fast, right? They matured quicker than everybody else. And they were the biggest kids in eighth grade, right? The best sports, oftentimes really intelligent too. But then you see them in high school seniors and they're the same height, right? And you kind of feel bad for them uh, on, a, on a crass level. Um, and the reality of the situation is that I, I was really tall when I was in eighth grade. I didn't grow much more. Right, so I felt that that's a very real um, reality. That made me special in eighth grade. I'm about three inches taller than I was when I was an eighth grader. Um, so that's a part of why we chose this book. Um, what does this ha book have to do with Lent? Lent is a season uh, in the Christian calendar whereby we are asked to look very deep into our own lives. We're called to be self-examining. Uh, we're called to pray uh, and, and called to for lack of a better way to say it, take stock of who we are, who we've been, what we need to repent of, and, and how we might need to move forward. And her book, I think, did a, a beautiful job of doing that, okay? Um, a Limitation, I will state, um, I think is a beautiful book. I think it's a wonderful book. I think sometimes it can be difficult to translate her book uh, into uh, scripture, right? I, th there's a part of me, if it was a perfect book, it would have more scripture, but she didn't ask me. And uh, I would imagine that if she's writing for a larger crowd, they may not want as much scripture, right? Um, there's a limitation to everything. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons that we chose it. Um, I think it was also a level of we all, ha um, not we all, but, but she's a known entity. Um, we've read her stuff before. I think three or four years ago we did. You know, um, everything happens for a reason. Uh, different, different groups have done that. So that's why we, we chose the book. Um, I think it was also, and I hope you felt this way, for me, it was an easy book. It was a very helpful book to start conversation. And for me, and again, this is my prayer for you all, these were conversations that I hope kept going. Maybe not all of them. There's a lot. Gosh, I mean, I have more notes on this book than I think I've ever taken. Right? And part of it was to, to help us walk through this. But there, there's just a lot of things for us to digest. And my hope is that you get to hold on to this kind of stuff and think, I don't, I'm not always going to have this experience where I want to go to Disney World. <laughs> but maybe you will have that experience of like, if we just had this one experience, everything would be well. And you can come back to this book. Um, so it's a conversation starter, which is what I wanted as we came back for the first time in three or two years uh, for Lent Lecture. Others, I mean, what, what does this book have to do with Lent for you all? We can end right here. This is a good question. I gave you my answer, which was long, but it is a book of hope. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for those online, uh, it, it's a book of hope. She does come out of the cancer, but she has very human reactions to every stage of the way, right? Um, which, which, again, I think is her ability. She has this beautiful ability to connect with each of us. And each, uh, some of the stories we connect with more so than the others, but that's just human nature. That's life. Others, what does this book have to do with Lent as we finish up? I do think she leads us very, very close to a conversation that we as humans don't always like to have, and that's coming up in a week from Friday, and that is death. I think she points out the realities of, of what it means to come really, really close to death. Um, she obviously gets to the point almost to death, but then she's able to survive it because of cancer treatments and, um, you know, all, I don't know what, luck, fate, uh, the divine plan, however we want to define it. Um, but she, I think she does a beautiful job of pointing out what it means to be on the verge of death, okay? Uh, and, and we as uh, humans, especially Americans and often uh, Christians, we talk about death, but we don't always talk about it as openly as, and she just does a beautiful job, I think. We're all going to die, right? She could have almost titled her book, We're All Going to Die, <laughs> right? And other truths I need to hear. Um, so... Uh, another, the, the last reason I'll say that I, I'm always drawn to her books is I think she does a really good job of talking about conversations that are happening in the world. Um, wellness industry, if you just do these things, all will be well. She, I don't think she debunks that, but I don't think she lets it ride scot-free, right? Um, and I think she's so beautiful and wonderful and honest when she says, like, oh, that wellness industry is terrible, and oh, I can't believe they're selling this, and then she's like, but at the same time, I do kind of want to be decorative, right? Like, she's honest, and I think honesty is really uh, a, a necessary truth that we need um, from people who have lived an experience that is incredible, Yeah, that's very true. Um, she allows her story to become not you need to do this, but she gives permission for you to feel, to act, to think, to worry, um, which I think is a really necessary genre in our world, right? I, I just finished another phenomenal book about Augustine, and they wrote about his confessions were his entire book was called Confessions, like it's the story of his life, and he, he writes it not as to say, look at me, look at me, look at me, which I don't think Kate does this either, but what he, the reason he wrote his book, they think, is because he said, look at me so you know two things. One, you're not alone, and two, God is with you in everything that's going on. I mean, those are two truths that we need to hear, right? And he talks a lot. I mean, if you read it, it's a beautiful book, The Confessions. It's, it's, it's this amazing story of, like, unbelievably su unbelievable success and unbelievable failure. And he talks about how that's how he knows God through all of that. And that's, I think, Bullard, I think Kate does a good job with that, too. Yep. Yeah, I mean, all of her stories, she's not the hero in her stories, which is a good sign. I mean, except if you want to be around somebody who's an absolute goober, right? <laughs> I mean, she just sounds like fun, which we all need somebody like that in your life. So. Does that answer your question? All right, we are past the time. Thank you all for the, this entire experience. I hope this was a good reading experience for you. Um, I will say this, too. I know it's getting close to the end, but uh, for next year, she wrote um, uh, a 40-day devotion. It's actually 40 and then some. She, has, like, she couldn't just write 40. Um, devotions for Lent. So if you, if you want, looking for a devotion for next year. I would also say I've not read it, but I would think you could probably read it anytime. It doesn't have to be Lent. But she does have another devotion out there, and, it's, um, and I have to imagine it's phenomenal. I know some, of, some folks have done it. So Thank you all to who's been on live stream, and thanks you all for coming. We'll see you, hopefully see you Sunday for Palm Sunday. <laughs>